Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, this is our pleasure today to have our second CRM camp colloquium given by Professor uh, Konstantin Mishakov from Rutgers University. Uh, as my former PhD supervisor, of course, it's a privilege and, a, and a honor to have him speaking today. Not only is he a great mathematician, but he's a good friend. So very pleased to have him um, speaking today. So Konstantin Mishakov obtained his PhD in 1985 at University of Wisconsin-Madison under the supervision of Charles Conley and afterward Paul Rabinovich. Uh, and since 2006, he's a professor in the Department of Mathematics of Rutgers University, and he became a distinguished professor there since 2011. And prior to his appointment at Rutgers, he was the director of the Center for Dynamical Systems and Nonlinear Studies, the CDSNS at Georgia Tech becoming the second director after Jack Hale. In 2014, he was named an EMS fellow for his contributions to dynamical systems, as well as to applied and computational topology. He has been the, the editor in chief of Journal of Differential Equations from 2000 to 2011. And he's, what, he's considered as a worldwide expert in dynamics, dynamical systems, mathematical biology, computational topology, and differential equations. And it is my pleasure today to uh, have him as our speaker, and please, Constantine, the floor is all yours. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, when Jean Philippe invited me to give the talk, he uh, he um, he asked me to give a talk about history, uh, and uh, I, I guess that just is an indication he thinks I'm really old. Um, but uh, so I thought about, you know, after I'd agreed to do it, then I thought about what am I going to say? And then I, I remembered these words of wisdom uh, from Ringo. Um, you know, you can either kiss the future or the past goodbye. Uh, and I'm just much more interested in the future than I am in the past. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's go to the future instead. So I, you, you still have a chance to, you know, hit the delete button at this point, uh, don't delete. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, if, if you're as old as I am, then you know that the, uh, the future is 2015. And uh, so I guess the future is already the past, all right? So um, this is all just to say that what you're gonna hear is an extremely biased, uh, very narrow perspective based on, on, on you know, my interest, what I've done um, uh, on the past, present and future of what I think of as, as um, you know, computational uh, proofs in, in dynamics. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of work that I'm not going to, to mention. Uh, I hope people won't be upset. Um, again, I, I, there's no pretense here that this is, this is a broad uh, uh, perspective of what's going on. Um, so what, I, what I'll discuss, and, and I want to emphasize each, you know, these are not, I'm not claiming to answer these questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, take a, an hour of your life and I hope you'll put up with it, uh, kind of uh, musing on these subjects. All right. So uh, the first one is, you know, why do we even bother to do this? Um, the second is, uh, since we're, you know, we think about using the computer to, to do rigorous proofs, uh, what, how does what we're doing uh, relate to the scheme of formal proof systems? All right, so, um, and, you know, we're, we're, it's been quite a while now since, uh, I think, you know, this seminar, if nothing else, is an indication that there really are quite a few people working on this subject. Uh, and I think it's worth thinking about what kind of perspectives this has or impact it has on uh, nonlinear dynamics as a subject. Um, of course, nonlinear dynamics is changing, or it should be changing, I would say, uh, to keep up with, um, with science and engineering. And the, the fact is that uh, I think the fundamentals of science are being greatly impacted by what we call data-driven science and machine learning. Um, and in some place, displacing is not replacing that, that that's not the that's definitely not the case, but displacing in terms of priority uh, basic theory. And, and I think we need to respond to that. And we should think about how, what's the proper way to respond. And 
along those lines, uh, I'll kind of finish with, with kind of, I think, a, a fundamental dichotomy that it's always existed between precision and accuracy. And uh, I'll try to make it precise what, what I mean by that when we get there. Okay, so, so let's turn to the first question. You know, why do rigorous computations in, in dynamics? And I, I think the, the simplest answer is, you know, most of us, or at least I am a mathematician, I consider myself a mathematician, and, you know, that's what mathematicians are supposed to do. They're supposed to prove things. Um, and I mean, that might sound a little bit glib, a little bit shallow, but in fact, I would argue that, um, you know, if, if we can't give a proof, then that's really an indication that we don't under completely understand the subject, or at least traditionally that was the case. Uh, you know, the lack of a proof, wherever that gap is in, in your reasoning is probably an indication that, that there's something going on there that we don't understand. This has changed with, uh, with the introduction of, of, um, of the use of the computer. And then I give you an example. I mean, I'm not going to go into any detail. Uh, so there's a, a link to a, a paper that uh, I think has appeared by now. Uh, Spontaneous Periodic Orbits in Navier-Stokes Flow by, by JB and, and, uh, and collaborators. Um, but uh, you know, there I think it's pretty clear that they understand what's going on. It's pretty clear that that they uh, have the kinds of the right kinds of estimates. But to do the full 3D problem is, you know, they, they just run out of uh, computational resources to do that. And so, um, uh, but you know, that also turns the question back around. Well, would there be a more compact way to represent or to do the analysis that's needed to get the results? All right. So, again, I would say that. The object of the proof, to a large extent, is to see whether we understand the problem, uh, whether we have compactified the problem enough so that uh, with whatever resources we have, we can compute. Um, I think, you know, if I was serious, um, uh, seriously trying to give a propaganda talk at this point, I would uh, probably give an example here of where people have gone wrong by just using standard numerics without uh, validating the, the results. Um, and I know there are examples like this, but I really don't care. I mean, to me, that's somehow, um, but it's not that it's not an important issue, but it, it's beside the point. I mean, I think that we should be doing proofs because proofs show that we completely understand the problem. And so, uh, yeah, examples exist where it's important to have done the, the, the numerics, but uh, I think the, it's a subject in and of itself of, of a mathematical question that, uh, that needs to be able, we need to be able to address it. Okay, so that's the first answer. We're mathematicians and, and we want, I would say that we should want to prove things. Um, the second answer, um, is maybe from a more practical uh, nature, but the, the reality is that uh, nonlinear uh, dynamics is, is driven by uh, computer simulations. I mean, I, I don't think it's a, it's a uh, coincidence that the interest in nonlinear dynamics that occurred in the 60s and 70s, I mean, there was a real revolution. I mean, I came into grad school at the in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. And, you know, at that point, it was, I think, already that, that huge wave of, of excitement had already become institutionalized. There was a subject of dynamical systems. Um, and I think a large, to, to a large extent, that was driven by the fact that phys physicists, engineers uh, were starting to see that if you did computations with a nonlinear system, you got really, really interesting results. And so, um, yeah, it, it's just inherent to try not to the, the beauty and the complexity that we see in nonlinear studies uh, and nonlinear systems have been driven by the computer uh, simulations. And therefore, uh, it's important that, that if we see things on the computer that we be able to validate them. Uh, so, um, so that's the second answer. But, the, the use of this word validate brings another point that I that at least for me is very important, and this is a, a personal prejudice, um, and that is that names matter, and I very re rarely refer to uh, to these kind of rigorous proofs as as uh, uh, validated numerics, and that's because even though I think it's important, 
I mean, I just gave you in terms of answer two that 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 is an important topic. Um, I, I think the computer is allowing us to kind of uh, frame mathematics um, in a such a way that it, on the on the minimum, you know, simple repetitive competition uh, computations can be used to gain greater mathematical understanding. Um, and so I really prefer computer assisted proofs. Uh, because I think there are lots of examples where, yes, the computer was used, but somehow the validation of the, the numerical computation was much less important than the, the actual uh, result. Um, and, and to give just a couple of examples, um, so this is something that, that, you know, I was actually working on these kinds of things way back in when I was doing my, my thesis. I wasn't doing any computations, but a beautiful result of of Churchill and Rod looking at, um, at Hamiltonian systems. Um, and they then wanted to apply their theoretical results to a concrete Hamiltonian, the um, Hinon Hiles uh, uh, system, I, if I remember correctly. And well, what they needed to do in order to make all their topological machinery work was to know that there were six finite time trajectories that had a certain geometric property. And well, okay, so they just had to take the differential equation and find these six trajectories. They did it rigorously. If you go in the paper, there's little tables of bounds. Uh, by today's comparisons, I said these are absolutely trivial computations. But the point was that six finite time trajectories were enough to uh, to conclude that there was a chaotic dynamics in these in these Hamiltonian systems. Uh, there was, you know, in, in, if you look at that paper, there's nothing really ab about validating numerics, uh, particular numerical computation. It was find these trajectories and this theorem now tells you that there's complicated dynamics. Um, there was a beautiful talk earlier the, uh, last semester uh, on, uh, on the um, computer assisted proof of the Feigenbaum conjectures. Um, and, you know, again, I don't think of that as, as valid as, you know, conceptually that the point was to validate numerics. This was actually to show that there was, a, um, you know, a fundamental uh, um, object in dynamical systems that it really was what people thought it was, right? So it was really a conjecture that was being resolved. Um, in a slightly different direction, I mean, we're starting to see libraries that are put together. I mean, I think CAPD is, is the, the most complete um, where these, you know, computer assisted proofs can be used almost directly to, to do computations. We don't need to think of, oh, there's a numeric, there are the numerical analysts who are going to lead the way, and then we're going to come back, you know, afterwards and, and solve these individual little problems. With, with some tool like CAPD, one can just be doing rigorous computations from the get-go, all right? So, and I, I suspect these kinds of packages will just continue to grow and then we'll, you know, there will, and I'll try to make this clear as we move forward, I think that there'll be less and less of a distinction between what was being done to validate results as opposed to just using the computer to understand mathematically nonlinear dynamics. Um, and I'll give a finish with one other example um, where, and this was uh, work that we did a while ago where we looked at a, a multi-parameter system. Um, we did rigorous dynamics on it from the get-go, not knowing what dynamics to expect to see. Um, and, you know, the, the, uh, the results of the, solu uh, the solutions that are found should all be interpreted from a mathematical perspective via algebraic topology. And so, you know, this is not that there's a particular trajectory or a particular object that was identified numerically first, and then we went back in a proof. Here's just a statement, given this dynamical system, here's a tool that we're going to use to study the, the global dynamics over, over ranges of parameters. I'll, I'll come back to this because I, I think this is uh, an important future direction, all right? So, um, uh, and, you know, the final answer I'd say is that, you know, there's a particular problem in dynamics that we're interested in and people haven't been able to resolve it yet. So, well, can we use the computer to get over some of the difficulties, right? And I don't think we should ever forget that, that 
you know, just being interested in solving a problem is a great reason to, to go and see if there are other tools out there, whether it's a computer or, or a different area of mathematics. Um, okay, so uh, having, you know, talked about these rigorous computations, uh, the, the next natural question is, well, how rigorous are we being, right? And I, I think it's pretty clear that there's, uh, there is, or I think everybody here is aware that there's a, a growing group of people uh, doing formal proof systems uh, where they're really trying to be able to guarantee that the mathematics is correct from uh, the bottom up. Um, and my claim is that, that mathematics will be the first of the, the STEM fields uh, where the machine surpasses the human, all right? So uh, we can you know, you know, speculate who's going to be the, the, you know, the John Henry of mathematics, uh, the, the, you know, the, the railroad worker, steam pile, um, pile driver who uh, you know, fought against the, the steam engine, right? Um, I, I, and you know, I don't know when this is going to happen, uh, but you know, if you go and look at one of the more recent versions of the notices, uh, Kevin Buzzard has I think a nice article in there on talking about proving theorems with computers. And I just took out two comments that he had made. One was that within a few years, he believes that the library and they're building this library in, the, in, in lean um, will cover all of undergraduate pure mathematics. Uh, and, you know, if I think about how much mathematics can be done with a, with a proper undergraduate education, it's uh, it's quite a bit. All right. So, um, I don't think, I think thinking about it doing novel mathematics is, is again, a different question. Um, but, you know, verifying proofs using the, the, the a tool like lean, I think it'll be happening, you know, it could be a, a standard feature much sooner than, than some of us expect. Um, uh, Kevin also says that, you know, looking further ahead, that uh, you know, we'll be shocked by the fact that the computer comes up and gives a uh, uh, a proof that people are interested in, uh, and it'll be sufficiently deep that uh, that we as humans won't be able to understand what the machine has done. Um, I actually think this is kind of an underwhelming statement uh, because I I would argue that it's already being done. I mean, if you think about something like AlphaGo Zero, right? This is a machine that on its own has learned what the rules of Go are and it's learned how to play Go and it plays Go much, much better than in human. Um, you know, Go, okay, I, I'm not gonna say that Go is as rich as mathematics, that would be silly, but at the same time, there are a formal set of rules and there is an object where the computer now does a much, much better job than people do and obviously, we can't explain to people what it's doing because, well, then people would be able to play against it and, and people can't, right? So uh, I don't think that there's gonna be a true culture shock. I think it's just gonna you know, creep in. There are gonna be some minor results that get done by the computer uh, and then it'll be a little bit more major and a little bit more major. And uh, I don't know, maybe at some point it provides us with a Riemann hypothesis, but by that time it, uh, it will be so, you know, so standard that, that results are being done with the computer that I don't think it'll be a, a culture shock. I think we're already there. Um, so having said this, and, and I mean, I think this is really important. I think this is in some sense the, you know, if, I, if I'm telling you that math is eventually gonna be replaced or people doing mathematics are going to be replaced by the, the computer, uh, that suggests it's pretty important. Um, on the other hand, you know, I could ask how many people in this audience are, uh, are working at the level of doing their proofs using Lean or Cock or Isabella or one of the other tools that are out there. Uh, my guess is not many. Um, and, you know, what about me? I've told you how important I think this is, and I'm not doing it because I'm too busy with other projects, right? And, and, and that's not, uh, I'm not being glib here. Uh, you know, mathematics has, there have been found, there are foundations of mathematics. Logicians are the ones that are doing it. Um, 
most of us mathematicians don't try to provide proofs on the level of rigor that would be uh, you know, formally required. Uh, we're kind of an interface between formal mathematics and the outside world, whether it's coming from mathematics itself or it's actually coming from applications. Uh, and I actually think that this is the place where, where uh, if we want to survive, that's where we're going to be. I mean, it, this, this interpretation of what is interesting um, and what is important is, is where we will have to reside because the formalities will be done better by the computer. Uh, and I, I think we can already see an, an analogy of this uh, in, in chess. Um, you know, the, again, Magnus Carlsen is the, the world's best chess player. And at least according to this article, he never plays against the computer because he finds it too depressing. And he just gets crushed. Um, on the other hand, he and I, my understanding is all the grandmasters train with, with the computer. They have ideas. Here's what I want. Here's, here's a strategy I want to work out, whether it works or not. And they play it with the computer to see how it should move forward or not. Right. So the, the, the computer is, is obviously a much better chess player, but that doesn't mean that it can't now be used very fruitfully to explore the world of chess. And I think this is what we will see happen with, with the computers. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, how should we should be thinking about this? You know, if, if we have the computer at our disposal to, uh, to do the, hard is the wrong word, the formal mathematics, um, how do we exploit it most, uh, most efficiently for to answer the problems we're interested in, or the problems that that you know the uh, the scientists and engineers are are interested in. All right, so I, I think that's something we should be should be actively thinking about. Um, and that leads me to my next question, right? I mean, if we are going to think about this interface that's going on between the 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 subject that in our case dynamics, the computer, and then us as people interested in understanding dynamics, um, you know, where, what should we be doing? And um, I, I have no broad answer. So I thought that to try to answer this, I would try to kind of talk about a problem that I found very interesting over the years and kind of see how it, how it gets put together. All right. And so uh, I want to talk about the Wright's equation. This is a very simple nonlinear uh, delay differential equation. Um, and I would like to you know, give you a conjecture, or it's still a conjecture, but, but I, it's a kind of conjecture that I think uh, could actually be, uh, be resolved, again, with the computer-assisted proofs. And that is that um, in, in a paper in 96, Chris McCord and I um, proved that the global attractor of Wright's equation, I mean, it's done more generally, but Wright's equation is, is the, a good model to have, uh, is that uh, we provided a semi-conjugacy of the attractor for uh, the scalar delay differential equation onto a very explicit uh, uh, compact uh, invariant set given by an ODE. Um, and the, the ODE itself was given to us by, uh, by John Malley Bray. So I won't take credit for, for saying what it should have been mapped to. We'll only take credit for, the, for the proving the existence of the semi-conjugacy. Um, and what I conjecture, and I, I think there's been a lot of progress made towards this, is that in fact, it's a conjugacy. It's not a semi-conjugacy. Um, so kind of the dynamics you see there of uh, as you change this parameter alpha, there are individual branches of periodic solutions that come off uh, and that that's, and then connecting orbits between them and that that's all the dynamics there is. So that, that's kind of what the conjecture is. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, about where we are with respect to this conjecture, all right? So um, when we wrote this paper, I had no reason to believe that this conjecture should be true. Uh, it's only, you know, in terms of light of, recent work in which I'll describe now that, that makes me think that, that this really should be true. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna kind of 
talk about ideas from from dynamical systems because these are the kinds of ideas that that we should be thinking about what how much of this should be done via the computer and how much of it uh, is is required by by us um, so I don't I, Jack Hale probably was not the first person to prove that that this particular system had a global attractor but the idea of the importance of global attractors for these infinite uh, dimensional dynamical systems uh, and especially in the context of delay differential equations, Jack Hale did a lot of work. So if you're interested in those kinds of ideas, then I recommend you go and look at his books. Um, with regard to these kinds of delay differential equations, Mali Pere proved that you could use a, that the concept of a Morse decomposition was an excellent way to organize the global dynamics. And Basically, his, his, he gets his Morse decomposition by saying that if you look at a solution to the delay differential equation and you look at how rapidly it oscillates, then with time, the, the number of oscillations uh, is never increasing. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into the details. You can look at the, the papers if you want details. But the point is that this notion of a Morse decomposition gives a nice way to organize what the global dynamics should be like. Um, if we, and you can now see that I'm very much not going in a chronological order when I, when I talk about this. So if we actually start looking for individual solutions, then um, it's easy to check uh, that, that zero is a fixed point. Uh, and then what was proven by Chow and Mali Pere was that as you vary alpha, so uh, yes, it's, uh, I've lost my mouse. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, now I've lost my mouse. Okay. Um, so that as you move along, as you vary alpha, then at, uh, at you know, 2n plus 1 over 2 pi, hop bifurcation, supercritical hop bifurcations occur. And so at least near the origin, we understand what, what the dynamics looks like. Um, and a conjecture that goes way back uh, is, is Wright's conjecture. And that was that if you're below pi over two, then the origin is not only stable, well, that you can do from local linear analysis, but that it's a global attractor. So in other words, any solution ends up at, at that origin. And um, that has been proven. And I've now highlighted this particular article in, in, in orange because it, was, it really required the computer-assisted proof to obtain this. And the way that this proof was obtained was by essentially proving uh, giving a computational version of the um, hop bifurcation uh, where you actually had explicit bounds, and that's what the, that set of extra set of dotted lines represents, is that over that range of alpha, you know that the result of the hop bifurcation uh, is true. All right, so in a neighborhood of that point and in a neighborhood of the origin, we completely understand because of their result what the dynamics is. And that was sufficient because an earlier investigation uh, by this group uh, argued that everything except what was in that little pink region that I've indicated, uh, that all those solutions ended up at the origin. And of course, and, and they did this with you know rigorous error bounds, uh, but you couldn't, they couldn't handle that little corner there because, well, with the error bounds, you had to argue that there was no periodic solution nearby. And of course, there is a periodic solution near, uh, nearby because there's the hop bifurcation, right? But, but they argued that all the other solution, any other initial condition ended up at the origin or in that pink region. And then the result by uh, Vandenberg and Jaquette, because they understand in a neighborhood exactly where the, the hop bifurcation was taking place, uh, there is no op other option but to end up at the origin. Right? So, uh, again, the, you know, Wright's conjecture has been around for a long time, and it was at the in the end at the end of the day, it was, well, let me say, not a difficult conjecture. Uh, you just had to let the computer do a lot of computing. All right, uh, and you know the the 
I don't want to take anything away. I mean, from the, the importance of the theorems that had to be proved in order to be allow the computer to do the work. But once it became time for the computer to work, it did it, and it didn't have. It wasn't massive computations to uh, to deal with this problem. Um, so I mean, this is kind of you know where we are now, uh, and. Uh, um, I want to go back to this uh, this result of Malley Perret with uh, with the Morse decomposition. Uh, he he not only gave said that this was a way to organize the information, but in fact he basically showed that given depending on how far out you went into the uh, into alpha, that you could find invariant sets with these given oscillation numbers. Um, and so, in terms of Malley Perret's result what you have is this kind of picture that there have to be these interesting solutions that oscillate, um, but there's almost no control on how many solutions there actually are. Now that's a bit uh, misleading and I'm ignoring a lot of people's work that controls the kind of secondary bifurcations that can happen. And in fact, it ends up that there can only be saddle node bifurcations and so this kind of picture is somehow representative of, of what the dynamics might look like. Of course, it could be even more complicated than what I showed. Um, Jones, uh, again, this is you know, early numerical studies of, of this, this nonlinear system. Uh, he conjectured that once you've had that hop bifurcation that occur, and we're talking 62, so this is before there was a proof of the hop bifurcation. Uh, so this is numerics that's guiding this. Uh, that um, once you've passed pi over two, then there is a unique slowly oscillating periodic solution. And as I told you, Mali Prey argues that, or gives this, uh, this lap number argument that says that the number of oscillations can, or the, 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 the frequency of the oscillations can never increase. And so these slowly oscillating periodic solutions are in some sense, the, the most stable objects of, uh, of the system. And so basically what Jones is arguing is that if you're past pi over two, then the typical solution is going to end up at, one of, at, at a unique slowly oscillating periodic solution. Um, now, uh, she in, in this thesis uh, um, proved that if you went alpha, made alpha large enough, then the Jones conjecture was actually true. And the reason that could be done was that he could analytically get ha his hands on um, the, uh, the Floquet theory for these periodic orbits. Uh, there's another important fact, and this comes from uh, work of Mally Perret uh, and Sell and, and Hal Smith that says that um, there's really a Poincaré Bendixson type theorem going on for, for these systems. And so uh, what she proves is that if you have a slowly oscillating periodic solution, then you can prove that it must in fact be stable. And because of Poincaré Bendixson, if I, I, the only thing I should be seeing there are either fixed points or periodic orbits. The only fixed point is a zero solution. So if I find two slowly oscillating periodic solutions, then the separatrix between them uh, two stable slowly oscillating periodic solutions and the separatrix between them must be a, a, an unstable periodic orbit. But she has showed us that for alpha bigger than 5.67, then you can't have unstable periodic orbits and therefore there must be a unique periodic orbit. Again, this is a, a purely analytic result. Um, but uh, this can be used now to, to kind of extend our understanding, again, bringing in the computer. And, and this is uh, uh, a theorem of Jean-Philippe. Um, and what he did was basically say, oh, well, she tells me that if I start large enough uh, and I find a periodic solution, then it, the stable periodic solution, which should be easy to find, then that's the only one that's, that I have to deal with. Um, and so now let's just do a continuation argument. Okay, so he developed uh, the ability to do rigorous continuation of periodic orbits in this infinite dimensional setting. And so he now gets to extend this line and notice that I've really changed the scale, right? I mean, instead of that being three pi over two, it's now 10 to the minus four. And he showed then that there were no bifurcations along that curve, all right? 
it didn't get rid of the possibility of isolas, but uh, but it does at least simplify the the possible dynamics. So we now have to rule out these isolas. And I mean, he only got down to ten to the minus four, um, and he stopped there in part because the computations were getting a little bit tough. Uh, but there was also no clear target to go to uh, because again, I'm not doing things chronic chronologically, uh, the result of, of uh, um, Bauer and Jaquette hadn't been done yet. So he didn't know how far he had to go in order to know that he was hooking up to the periodic orbit that came from the, the Hopf bifurcation. Um, and, and so we did some work. We, we, we extended this. But at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, Jonathan Jaquette who, uh, who proved Jones conjecture. And, so basically, after he and, and uh, JB had, uh, had identified the domain on which the Hopf bifurcation took place, he was able to, again, do a continuation argument to link Jean-Philippe's result up with, uh, uh, with uh, the Hopf bifurcation result. And then, and this is the part that I found the most surprising, he was able to, with relatively simple computations, uh, exclude any other periodic orbit existing there. And this is, you know, if you think about this, we're in an infinite dimensional space. There are, there is a constraint on, on the behavior of these solutions. Uh, but I was surprised by how easy, and I mean, and, and I, this is not to take anything away from what Jonathan did. I mean, it, to me, it was enlightening that it was, at least to me, surprisingly easy to, uh, to exclude the rest of the periodic orbit. So, you know, going through and looking through space, the infinite dimensional space and excluding arguments, uh, excluding the existence of, of orbits is actually very doable. Um, and so um, this, I, I don't know how, how ubiquitous this kind of phenomena is. I mean, there's a lot of, of nonlinear equations, uh, you know, that, again, this was a, a big topic in the 80s and 90s was trying to do infinite dy dimensional dynamics. Um, and one of the hurdles that one constantly ran into was, okay, I found a curve and along this curve, maybe I can do some bifurcation analysis but how do I know that I've seen all the solutions? And uh, what Jonathan did, at least for this problem, is to show that that's actually something that can be done by the computer and without a huge cost, all right? So, so the point is that, um, yeah, the, the moral of this story, I guess, is that uh, you know, between the classical analysis uh, and the rigorous use of the computer to check for specific uh, questions, um, we can handle what, at least, you know, if we're going back to Jean-Philippe and we talking about history, you know, what the kinds of problems that in the, you know, in 80s and early 90s just did not seem at all feasible that we would be able to resolve. Um, and not only can it be done, but it's on the way of becoming routine. Again, you know, if you look at things like the CAPD package, a lot of the, the little details that would ha would normally be done to solve a problem like this, there are there is you know libraries that one can use to go and, and try to address those kinds of problems. Um, okay, so I don't have an answer at this point, more as, as a question, right? I mean, if you look at an example like this, and, and we could have picked other different classes of problems. Um, you know, what part of the nonlinear dynamics do we want to focus on? Um, at, at the moment, proving something like uh, Mali Perret's result on, on the existence of a Morse decomposition uh, is not something that we do with the computer. But if Buzzard is right and all of nonlinear mathematics is, is uh, built into libraries pretty, uh, 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 undergraduate mathematics is built into libraries pretty soon then uh, it's not, it'll only be a little bit longer before those kinds of results themselves are accessible from the computer. Um, so, you know, where should we be focusing our attention as, uh, as 
as if we want to think about nonlinear dynamics, what what parts should be really optimized to be done by the computer? How much analysis should we be doing? How much analysis should we dump on the computer? Um, I, I don't have answers to this, but I think these are the kind of questions that, that we should be keeping in mind as, as we move forward. Um, topics that really seem out of reach at the moment for systematic methods of, and, and I think these are our important questions, and I'll, I'll make some comments about it later, um, but that's to kind of understand the global dynamics of families of systems. So we know how to do rights equation. But the rights equation, if you go back to Malley Perret's papers, um, they're much, much more general than the rights equation. It's just a very special example. Uh, I would not be surprised if uh, very similar kinds of results could be proven for a much broader class of, of problems, but I, I really don't even know how to get started in what are the directions of perturbations to rights equation that would, uh, the, for which the same results would hold. The other way around is kind of maybe an engineering question. Uh, if there's a particular type of dynamics out there, uh, what set of, of nonlinear systems exhibit it? Um, this really is, is of interest and, and I've gotten, been involved in it more recently in the context of uh, synthetic biology where, where bioengineers are trying to build networks. Um, and they have parts, but they don't know what's the best way to put the parts together. Um, and I, I don't think from a dynamical systems point of view, uh, we have analytic answers. And so it's going to have to be computational work that does this. How do you organize the computational work to try to answer those kinds of questions? Okay, so, um, you know, as we're moving forward, I mentioned this, uh, we're going to see more and more um, what I call data-driven science. And, and I think of data-driven science as there isn't a fundamental theorem, there isn't a Navier-Stokes equation out there that we can take as truth, you know, probably should put quotation marks around there, but where a solution to, to that equation is, you know, can be guaranteed that this has meaning in, in the particular subject. Uh, and so, We've built all these computational tools. Uh, we have all these ideas about about computations and proofs. Uh, how do we use those in this context? Okay, and so uh, there's lots of different roads I could go down here. So I'm going to pick one thread and 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 go along that idea. Okay, so what it is possible, and then I'm choosing this because in some sense it it might be the easiest way to think about uh, about the tools that we have. So and this is. I don't know if these were the first people to do this, but uh, this is maybe the paper that, that brought it to my attention. Um, so it's possible to go from time series data to a differential equation uh, with parameters. All right, so you, you give it, you, and what they do here is you, they take a different, they take some equations, they sample them, uh, and then from the sample, they say, okay, what model should I use if I want to represent this? And they claim they get back the models that they want. Um, so, and this is being done more and more, all right? So if, if somebody comes and hands you an ODE that was obtained using this kind of a technique, um, what does it mean to prove something about the dynamics? All right. uh, okay, so is it wrong because it was a computer that took data and produced a model? Um, and how is that really different from, from what Kepler did or Newton does? Uh, we kind of pretend that there's a difference. I think if we actually tried to pin down what that difference is, we, we would have a little more trouble there. Uh, so, you know, if, if someone hands you this model and said, well, the computer did it because it had a certain amount of data, um, at what point do you say, oh yeah, I'm gonna really prove something about this OD. Uh, I, I think if we're gonna be dealing with data, then with high probability, we're gonna to have to incorporate statistics into, into our arguments. Um, we haven't done that as far as I know, I, I, I don't see results out there, but I, I think that's a, a very um, um, important direction to go. Um, the second thing that goes with this is that, you know, 
oftentimes when we do the computer assisted proofs and and this is not a criticism i you know when i've done the proofs uh we i've done the same you know it's a question of how good a job can we do right we often come with with really extreme precision um if we were you know if i'm a data scientist then i'd probably be talking about overfitting at this point right and i'll come back to and i'll come back to this again all right um so you know can we do these computer assisted proofs with really little precision uh here's an example uh again same idea uh, this is from this particular article where they took the lorentz equations ran it through their machinery and they get back the lorentz equations at the right parameter values um let me turn the question around since we're interested in dynamics and ask is this what we want to do? Right, I've, I've taken data and I've reproduced a differential equation. And the reason I ask, and the reason I use the Lorentz equations is because, you know, we understand the attractor of the Lorentz equations, thanks to Tucker, computer assisted proof. Um, but what does he prove? In some sense, what he does is he says, I'm going to take the ODE and I'm going to show you that it matches a geometric model. And for anybody who's worked with the Lorentz equations, uh, I, my guess is that you understand the dynamics of the Lorentz equations because of the Guggenheimer Williams model rather than because of the massive amounts of, of data, right? So, somehow, maybe what we should be doing is rather than trying to take data and produce an ODE, we should be trying to take data and produce a model for what the dynamics represents uh, in a way that we as people understand. And there we're now getting into this geometric and topological representations of dynamics. Maybe that's a better way to go, right? So maybe this is just the wrong way to think about doing the, the computer assisted proofs. Um, I don't, I, that's too strong a statement, but it is, does open the, the realm so that maybe we should be trying to obtain different types of results. Okay, so the last point I wanted to make, and this is this dichotomy with precision and accuracy. And as I said, oftentimes when we're doing the computer assisted proofs, we, we obtain extreme precision. And uh, I just want to put up an absolutely beautiful picture. I think it's a beautiful result. Uh, you know, the stable manifold for the Lorentz equations at classical parameter values and error bounds of 10 to the minus four. I mean, and you can see we're going from, uh, you know, minus 100 to 100. This is, I just find it amazing that this can be done, right? Especially with these kinds of error bounds. It's just, Incredible. On the other hand, uh, you know, if I change the parameter values for Lorentz slightly, uh, these results are no longer valid. All right, because in some sense they're just too precise. The, the existence of the stable manifold doesn't change, but where it actually is does change. And so, you know, this the question is how do we move forward? And I'll just finish here very very quickly with with work that we're trying to do. Um, and you know, in this data-driven age, uh, it's very it's easy to collect lots of data on you know inter pairwise interactions, and then these become models rather than writing down the differential equation. People write down the pairwise interactions, and so there's a model for interactions. And then you could ask, you know, what's the dynamics expressed by this network? There's no differential equation there. Um, uh, I'm going to make an assumption that that when somebody wrote this down, the reason they used pointy arrows was because there's, they're gonna, there's an, a sigmoidal type interaction between these terms. And the fact that it's a pointy arrow means it's a sigmoidal going up. Uh, and now I'd like to know what the dynamics is, all right? And so we've built software, call it DSGRN, dynamic signatures generated by regulatory networks that's supposed to address this question. And I'm not going to give any details, uh, you know, now that we've all moved to, to uh, YouTube, I gave a lecture on this topic two weeks ago at the Applied uh, Algebraic Topology Network. Uh, so you can, if you care about what I'm about to talk about, you have to go and watch this, this other hour of, of me. So we can just chain ourselves in ad infinitum giving talks. Um, but what DSGRN does is it looks at this network and it says, oh, this is really the input to the, to the program. It says, oh, that should be modeled with an 18 dimensional parameter space. And not only that, but you should take your parameter space that, you know, the positive orthon in R18, uh, and you should divide it into 1600 regions. These are explicit regions. 
um, that we, to keep track of this, we represent that as a graph. Each of the nodes in this graph represents one of these regions, which is a semi -algebra, explicit semi-algebraic set. And edges between these regions indicate, in, edges between these nodes indicate that the two regions share a co-dimension one subspace. So this is some way to kind of try to capture the geometry of these regions in this 18 dimensional space. For each one of these regions, there's a set of parameters associated to it. And what we do is we build a combinatorial model that goes with this, um, with this dynamics. All right, and so there's a picture at one parameter region. That's the combinatorial model. The arrows kind of show you how boxes get mapped to boxes. Um, and you change parameters and you're gonna get different boxes. You change parameters again, you're gonna get different uh, one of these, these combinatorial models. Um, these are complicated. And so what we do is we reduce it to a Morse graph. So this is a post set. And you've heard the word Morse before and you heard it in terms of Morse decompositions. This is kind of the ordering relation that is underlying the Morse decomposition. And given all this combinatorial information, we can compute something that looks just like the Conley index. Um, once I have the Conley index, then I've got lots of theorems about uh, dynamics, all right? And I, I don't wanna go through them. I just wanna say that basically the, the, the whole philosophy here is that you have this homology computation, uh, you have something else, and then you know something about dynamical systems. So just pure combinatorial information, finite data is, is enough to, to make statements, interesting statements about dynamics. Now, at this point, I'm going to make a claim um, because we, we're finishing off the proof of this. I, I, I think it's probably a theorem by now, but until all the details are written down, I'm not going to claim it as a theorem. And, and this is a big effort that we've been having going on for a long time, is that um, if you give me that network and you write down these differential equations and you go to a particular region in this DSGRN parameter graph, um, and you take the parameters and you plug them into the equations, then if the D, the exponent here is sufficiently large, then I have already computed Morse decompositions and Conley indices. And so I can tell you lots about the dynamics for this differential equation, all right? So this is an attempt um, to try to get around this issue of work, you know, the question I asked earlier, if we've, if we don't re, if we, if, somebody just gives us some crude information about the, the dynamics, can I actually talk about, in a mathematical sense, dynamical systems? Um, and in fact, you know, I talked about perturbing away from uh, the Wright's equation. I don't need these specific nonlinearities. The only thing that's really important for these results is that the nonlinearities be steep enough sigmoidal functions. Um, so what we're doing here you know, we're, these are theorems, so I'm providing you with accuracy about the dynamics, but of course I've completely given up on, on precision. I mean, that box in the right shows you how phase space has been subdivided and it's incredibly crude. Um, on the other hand, I can tie it back to differential equations. And since it's tied back to differential equations, if you now want to, you can go back and say, well, what can you tell me about the kind of dynamics that I told you exists for high D? What how does that dynamics persist as you let D get smaller? Uh, and this is Shane Kepley and Elena Quirello are, are working on this problem. Uh, the, what's really difficult once we get back to the classical language of dynamical systems is that we're working in an 18 dimensional parameter space, right? I mean, how do you keep track of, of the detailed dynamics when it's happening on such high dimensional manifolds, all right? And, and that's what they're really struggling with at the moment, I think. All right, so in summary, let me just kind of, you know, these are not answers, but the, you know, kind of summaries of, of answers to these questions. Um, why do rigorous computations? Well, it's important. I think nonlinear dynamics is important. The numerics, I think basically is the only way to access its, its structure in detail. And we want to be correct about the answers that we're giving. Um, uh, we need to think hard about how the kind of work that we're doing will fit into uh, formal proof systems. You know, what is it that we, we because the formal proof systems are gonna take over 
and then they're going to become undecipherable. And we do not want to end up in this land that's happening right now with artificial intelligence, where it's governing our life, making important decisions, and we don't understand why it's making those decisions. And, and I think we need to think about that before it's, it's suddenly thrust upon us. Um, I think that, you know, what's being done with the computer is fundamentally changing what, what problems can be done uh, and what problems are interesting and not interesting. Um, uh, I, I think it's probably worth thinking about this harder and trying to formalize it more. Uh, I, I just kind of gave you an example in the context of, of a particular problem. Um, we should be thinking about how the techniques that we've been developing can be best uh, modified or applied to deal with, with the fact that science and engineering is changing. You know, the differential equation that we spend a lot of time to try to get a precise result about is not necessarily uh, truth for the, the scientists and the engineers. It's just something that's there that, because it's a, a convenient way for them to describe what's going on. And maybe we should even try to push them away from using differential equations and think of, of more geometric or topological representations of the dynamics. Um, and this dichotomy between precision and accuracy, it's always been there. It's just that, uh, you know, now that we have access to enormous amounts of data, um, it just becomes a, a, a more obvious question. Um, and, and again, I, I think the answer, there's no universal answer there. It's going to depend on the problem, but trying to systematize how much precision, how much accuracy we want is something that, that we should we should think about. Thank you for listening to me for an hour, kind of babbling with some ideas. Um, again, thanks. Thank you very much, Constantine. That was great. You said you didn't, you would not go to history, but you went all the way back to 1955. So, and you talked about Newton and Kepler. So, well, you know, if, if 2015 is the future, then. <laughs> All right. So are there any questions or comments? There was, in fact, a comment in the, in the, by Stefano Galatolo, I think when you, I, mean, I don't know if Stefano is still there, if you want to uh, address what you were saying. Yes. Uh, do you see me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. No, it was a, a little a little comment on a question that was posed during uh, during the seminar. What direction? Now we know a lot about the topological properties of dynamics and attractors and uh, so on. What would be a direction where to go? And uh, my opinion was that uh, we we need to develop more the computer assisted proof for the ergodic properties, the statistical properties of dynamics and, and so on and so on, because, it, because this is what becomes uh, very important to understand uh, what happens when a system is, uh, is chaotic and, and so on and so on. Yeah, I, 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 again, I, um, you can see my, my as, I, as I promised, it was very biased. I mean, there's, I, I mentioned, did not mention anything about the you know, the computations in terms of the statistical mechanics computations, which I think are, are equally important, right? Uh, again, um, I think the, um, an important question there is this precision versus accuracy is going to come about. One of the reasons I've, I've shied away from the statistical mechanics perspective uh, and the invariant measure perspective is because it's, um, it seems to me in that setting, it's so much harder to decide um, uh, how do you know that you've computed something correctly uh, for a variety of systems rather than a single system, right? And, and that could be my ignorance, but I think that's a, that's a real question. If, if, if we don't know the specific system that we want to work with, but we're working with you know, a, uh, a model that's been put together by a finite amount of data, how do I understand what, my, um, what the invariant measure that could be computed should be and how much you know, variance there should be in that, in that invariant measure? 
Um, now that that's yeah. I, I think I that's agree. an interesting question, and I, I'm, I'm I, I agree is uh, is more complicated and and even more if you want to consider families of systems. Uh, but uh, well, I, I because uh, people, my my small uh, my small contribution to. <laughs> well, I encourage people to think about that problem. I, I'm just saying I think it's very very hard, but I think it is very important. I, you know, as we get the higher, especially, you know, I don't know how to do any of these topological methods when the dimension of the attractor, you know, if you have a strange attractor of you know of of higher dimension. Uh, I don't think they're nice topological results. The only results I know to understand that is comes from from invariant measures and things like that. So I think it, it really is important for SUVAC. So again, it's it's my bias and really my ignorance that that kept me from talking about that. Other well, questions. Maybe may I make a remark on this dichotomy between a precision and arithmetic uh, and accuracy. Uh, so I see what I missed a little bit is the, is the statement that often we need the precision to get accuracy. So uh, as soon as you have a nonlinear situation where you want to prove something by a fixed point argument, then you need the precision in order to conclude the fixed point argument. So that me, so uh, I, I think the precision, precision is important in many cases when you want to do a computer assisted proofs, even at the, if at the end, you don't need the precision for your statement, you want to prove existence of something, but nevertheless, you need the, the precision within the proof for the fixed point argument. I agree with you in the sense that many of our proofs are based on that. And the question is, I mean, is this really essential, right? Um, you know the the theorem that this that that's kind of these examples that I gave, right? I mean, this if I go back up here, right? There's really almost no precision involved in 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 these results. Um, when I flip back and then say, here's the differential equation, I do have theorems that say it's true for high dimensions, um, for a high you know for steep exponents, so for d large. I, I've proved theorems about the the d differential equations, um, and there's almost no precision going into this. Uh, the question, on the other hand, of course, is, and this is the hard work now, is what what Shane and Elena are trying to do, is that when you now say, okay, let's pull d back down, how do you keep track keep track of this information um, without falling into this need of precision and i i'm not claiming they have a result there i mean i don't think they're even thinking about it that way they're trying to use more standard tools to, to get at this but uh but it it somehow there is a um there's a, a a tension there i mean i we get all these results for high for large d with almost no precision and then suddenly to care move them a little bit a lot of precision some, somehow suddenly starts being required in the problem. Um, so I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. Uh, I'm, but I am saying, can we, is there a way to get around needing the precision to do the computation? Does that yeah, what, what, what I mean is in, in your case, when you're aiming at topological quantities, that I, that's, that's fine. Of course, then it is, uh, uh, one should try to to not need the precision but what i'm saying is as soon as you use fixed point arguments then it's inherent in the argument that precision is needed you need a self mapping if you want to apply a fixed point argument and that needs precision well i think you I can mean, get I know, around for that. Example, that that for this differential equation uh there is a fixed point in this region and there's a fixed point in that region all right. Again, I used algebraic topology to guarantee it. I don't know that it's unique. I mean, there are all sorts of things that I don't know about it, right? But but the existence comes from a fixed point argument, right? Um, not a contraction mapping argument, but from a, an algebraic topological fixed point argument, right? Oh, okay. So that, then, if you can apply topological fixed point arguments, then I then uh, I think you're right. 
But in, in many cases, we can't use topological arguments, but we just need a fixed point argument. I, so I agree with I absolutely with. agree with you. And, and and I find that, you know, as somebody who comes from the topological side, I always find that very frustrating, right? Um, because you guys do so much better job than I can with my topological tools, right? And 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 you know, so I'll, if I knew how to do it, I would, but I, I would like to see if there are ways to, to reduce the amount of precision that's, that's required. Yeah, if you put it like this, I, I agree, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Jorge has a, has a comment. Jorge, you want to... Uh... I don't see the chat because I'm sharing my screen, but... Uh... Yeah, so Jorge Gonzalez said, uh, I think the issue is to understand the scale of the problem. But he's not manifesting himself, so. Okay. That's already 10 past 11. Um, so unless there are other questions from our crowd. Um, well, I would like Constantine to thank you very much once again. It was, it was a real pleasure. Um, yeah, to see this kind of perspective talk, it's it's always inspiring, and uh, and uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna tell my future students to just go and see your talk. <laughs> <laughs> just watch it; it's very, it's very useful for us. All right, so I, I hope so. Yeah, and uh, well, let me thank you uh, once again. Um, it was great, and uh, I mean, we will see you guys uh, next week for Florent Briard, Florent Briard's talk. Uh, and uh, well, see you around. Thank you very much, Constantine. Take care, everyone. Thank you, yeah. Constantine. Thank you, Constantine. Well, thanks for listening. It was... <laughs> and have uh, cross, uh, cross country skis tomorrow. What's that? And have nice cross country ski tomorrow. Yeah, well, the, everything's melting here at the moment. So. Oh, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just had a lot of rain, freezing rain last night. So the snow is pretty, pretty lousy. Uh, okay. in, this, but, in this case, uh, stay safe. <laughs> okay. That's two for everyone else. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.